Good to see everybody here this evening. I invite you to grab your Bibles and open them up to the book of Philippians. Uh, looking in chapter 3 tonight, You're looking at verses uh, 1 to 8. It might be a, a somewhat familiar passage to some of you. I'm calling tonight's message, The Gains of the Gospel. The Gains of the Gospel. Uh, if you're like me, um, you know, we all have hopes. We all have dreams for ourselves and for our children and uh, for some of you and, and Leslie and I before long for our grandchildren. Um, we want them to have, you know, a long and healthy life. We want to be able to, you know, for us and for our family to be able to excel, you know, in all that we do and to be financially secure. That's, you know, we want that. That's something we, we want. Uh, we want to be thought of well and respected in the community. And, and we want, you know, our, our children and grandchildren and to be responsible, you know, and productive members of society, right? That's, that's you know, that's not asking too much. That's where we kind of, you know, we, we want these things to happen. But you see, what if we achieve all that, that, all those things and we never or they never gain a relationship with Jesus Christ? Right? What if they achieve all those things? What if they or CEOs, or presidents, or whatever the case is, and have all these things that we hope for them to be, and they're well-respected, and yet they never have a relationship with Jesus Christ? What if they gain the whole world, and yet lose their souls? What have they really accomplished? You see, Jesus asked this very question to His disciples in Mark 8, Mark 8, 36 and 37, for what it... What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You see, we have an enemy that constantly is tempting us to find our fulfillment in other things and everything else besides Jesus Christ. He wants us to find our fulfillment in careers, money, sports, academics, leisure, retirement, relationships, family, and on and on I could go. And we can even try to find our fulfillment in our religious activities. When I say religious, like church stuff, sometimes we find our, our, our identity and our fulfillment in things that we do here. But you see, you can either gain the whole world or you can gain Christ, but you cannot gain them both. You cannot. There can only be one Lord of your life and you can't serve two masters is also something that Jesus would tell us. In the word. But let me give you a warning. All that this world has to offer you is temporary. And it will all go away whenever you close your eyes in death. Your money, all your degrees, your fine home and your perfectly manicured yards, your corner office, your beauty, your power and authority, and even your commitment to your family will have zero impact on your eternity. Zero, none, nada. So hear me well this evening. Nothing matters more in this life than gaining Christ through believing His gospel. Nothing matters more than this. That is the greatest gain that you can ever experience. The Apostle Paul had learned this truth after spending his entire life trying to achieve perfect righteousness through his own efforts through Judaism. He was a devoutly religious man. That's what the Bible tells us. He was an extremely moral man. According to human standards, he was a good, good man. Now, you couldn't have found a, a better person than him, humanly speaking. But ultimately, none of that mattered because he was also as lost and condemned to hell that any other man might be. You see, we all are, unless we have indeed gained Christ. That's our condition. Every one of us are condemned without Christ. That the Bible makes it clear that we are all guilty of sin and that the just punishment for our sin is death and eternal condemnation in hell. No exceptions. No exceptions. Nobody gets a free pass. There are no good people, only guilty people. The good news for you to, that tonight will be yet another opportunity for you to gain Christ and to be reconciled back to God through believing His gospel. You see, tonight you can repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus. Tonight you can stop chasing after things that ultimately have no eternal value and 
are likely only pulling you further away from following after Jesus. Today could be the greatest day of your life. You see, today could be the day that you gain Christ by gaining the gospel. So go ahead and grab your Bibles and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word together. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Father, we are grateful for this day. We're grateful to be under your word tonight. Father, we are grateful that, that you have called us to this place to hear this word, to hear this message, Father. We ask that you would help us to receive it tonight. Help us to apply it to our lives. God, we ask that you would teach us the, the great treasure and the great value that we must place on having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing else is as is, is important as that. Help us to treasure the fact that we have gained Christ for those who have trusted Christ. And for those who have not yet trusted Christ, give them a desire to want to gain Christ through the gospel. Thank you once again for what you have done and what you will do. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Let me begin by just, just a little bit of just full disclosure tonight. You see, you do gain, when you gain a new relationship with Christ, right, through gaining the gospel, right? You do, we understand that, that it, that's the upside. But you also gain other things as well, right? We, we're excited about being forgiven of our sins. We're excited about being reconciled back to God. We're, all those things are what excite us, but there's other things that come along whenever we gain Christ. Some of them are really good and some of them will make your life much, much harder than it is or, or is or was before you trusted Christ. And some of you already know this. But that's why Jesus warned everyone that wanted to follow him and to be his disciples to do what? Count the cost. Count the cost before you say yes to follow after him. I believe there are three gospel gains in our passage for us tonight. Uh, some are good and some are bad, if you want to label it that way. The first gospel gain that we see in our text is new joy. Joy, joy in your life. Again, verse 1 says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. And as I was preparing this message, I was sitting there and I, and just thinking to myself, I, bet, I was thinking that sometimes it must seem like you, know, you basically, basically keep hearing the same sermons preached over and over and over again. Like it's like, it's like does, he, does he keep on preaching the same sermons? And if you know, it's not the same text, but that is the same message. It is. And I, and I am, in a, in a, and basically I am doing the same things over and over again. You see, the gospel must be central in every sermon that comes from this pulpit, as, as much as, it, as we enjoy having messages and teachings about how to be a better parent or being a better husband or how to manage your money well, all those things are helpful to us. But the most helpful thing that you can hear is the gospel. Even saved people need to continue to hear the gospel, to be reminded of what Jesus Christ has done. 
that the gospel of Jesus Christ must never grow old to us. It didn't to Paul. It certainly did not to Paul. The Bible has one theme from cover to cover, the redemption of fallen humanity. All the way through it, you see the same thread continually throughout the pages. That redemption only comes through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. You see, the gospel not only saves us, it also sustains us as we await the consummation of our redemption in Christ, when our faith will finally be made sight. And so Paul is calling for the Philippian Christians to rejoice in the Lord from a Roman prison, right? Rejoice in the Lord. He's writing this letter again. I would remind you, this is yet another one of the prison epistles. Rejoice in the Lord. And, uh, and I don't know, I've never been to prison. Hopefully I never will be uh, in prison unless it's for my faith. Amen? But prison is typically, from what I understand, not a place known for its joyfulness. <laughs> right? <laughs> not most prisons anyway, I wouldn't think. And so Paul's joy was not determined by his circumstances. Paul's joy was determined by the gospel. And that's what it must be for us also. That he had been saved by the grace of God. His sins were forgiven. All of them. Past sins. Present sins. And even the future sins that he had not yet even committed. That he was no longer an enemy of God. In fact, he was adopted into the family of God. And he was also a joint heir with Jesus Christ according to the word of God. That he was no longer dead in his sins and trespasses. Because he had been made alive by believing the gospel. You see, gospel people are or should be joy-filled people, right? Gospel people are joy-filled people. That Paul used the, 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 the word gospel 71 times in his writings. 71 times. I guess you would say that it must be pretty important for he keeps on bringing it up, keeps on using that term. And of course, besides Jesus, the gospel was his favorite thing to write about. And Paul could never be accused of being a closet Christian. He certainly wasn't ashamed of his faith in Christ or the gospel, was he not? Romans 1.16, he even, he even said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. You see lost people, your, your, your neighbors, your, uh, your, your co-workers, and it might even be a, some, for some of you, a spouse or your children. Listen, they don't need to hear advice on how they need to be better people. Right? That's not what we do. That's not what we're called to do. We're not here to give advice. Lost people need to hear the gospel. And they need to hear it over and over and over again until they finally say yes to the gospel. That the gospel brings the dead back to life spiritually now and literally when Christ returns for His church. That's how Paul could rejoice in the Lord from a Roman prison. That he was filled with joy because he knew that he had gained Christ through the gospel. And so I would just pause now and ask you, have you gained the gospel? Have you believed the gospel? Is your life filled with joy because of the gospel? You see, when you gain Christ through believing the gospel, you also gain joy. The second gospel gain that we see in our text is new opposition we don't like this one too much we don't we don't we don't like this one but we see here in, in verse 2 paul writes beware of dogs beware of evil workers beware of the mutilation and of course when i got to there that that first warning beware of dogs you know where my mind went i get your attention william beware of dogs right he, he has a, a a up close encounter uh, and so this is personal to him. He'll, he'll probably remember that. Are you highlighting this verse? That, that path, that part in your Bible? You probably should. It'll stick with you. He says, I don't need to highlight it. I got, I can look at my leg and remember this one. Right? Beware of the dogs. And, uh, you know, I've confessed before that I, I tend to watch maybe too much, a little too much television. Um, uh, and believe it or not, Leslie doesn't always like some of the shows that I like to watch. She thinks, you know, she thinks some of them are just, they're just dumb. She's like, I don't know where, why, why we're watching this. We can, let's watch something else. Let's, we can watch the weather channel, anything. Let's not watch this. And so I don't know why, but, uh, I do, uh, tend to like the Alaskan bush, bush people. Anybody else in here watch that every once in a while? <laughs> William's saying, I've, I've seen it. Uh, 
I don't know what it is. I just, uh, I just uh, enjoy watching it. And I remember one episode uh, where they kept having a bear problem. If you don't know what Alaskan bush people is, it's a show about a family that's living off the grid and, and, and the outback or supposedly in Alaska. And they're living on their own and they're trying to, you know, have their own homestead and all those type of things. And so if you're going to live out in the wilderness, then there's wild animals in the wilderness. And so in one episode, they kept having this problem with a bear. And it, and it kept on coming into their uh, uh, their little homestead area. And, and one time it just it got into the house and just ruined everything. It had stuff everywhere, bear poop everywhere, food everywhere, just, just ripped everything to pieces. And so, uh, you know, in, instead of them, you know, dealing with the, the bear like any normal people probably would, they, they thought they would just fire a couple of warning shots in the air, right, and, and just kind of live at peace with the bear and kept on rebuilding and just cleaning things up after the bear left. You know, they know that the, the, the bear is a huge threat, but they just keep on trying to coexist. Keep on trying to coexist with an apex predator. You don't coexist with something that will eat you. It doesn't work like that. Nature will take its course. Coexisting with bears doesn't work, and coexisting with false teachings doesn't work either. It does not work. Just shoot the bear and the problem is solved. Make yourself a rug, whatever you need to do, but get rid of the bear. You see, by this point in Paul's ministry, he has had many encounters with these same false teachers that were now attempting to corrupt the gospel in Philippi. That he could, you know, he could not have them killed like a nuisance bear, but he could expose their false teachings and kill their ministry. That's what he's warning of here. He's wanting to expose them. They were known as the Judaizers. If you're familiar with your New Testaments and, and, and Paul's letters, he's spoken of these same individuals quite often. They were Jews that were false converts to Christianity. They preached a, a, a false gospel or a counterfeit gospel that saved no one. They taught faith in Jesus plus the additional works and rituals of Judaism. They say, yes, it's fine and good. If you want to repent of your sins and you want to place your faith in Jesus, that's fine, but you also have to do everything that Judaism says as well. So it's, again, Jesus plus. Jesus plus anything doesn't save anyone. It's Jesus alone that saves. And so if you add anything to the gospel, you lose the gospel. If you take anything away from the gospel, you lose the gospel. You see, the devil, you need to hear this, the devil has missionaries too. He does. The devil has missionaries too. In this case, they were the Judaizers. And here in America, the devil's missionaries uh, come in all different shapes and sizes and colors and beliefs. Uh, one, one of the, the, the main, or, or the, two of the main ones uh, that influence uh, our communities uh, here in America are Mormons. Mormons are one and Jehovah's Witnesses are another. But sometimes the devil's missionaries are men and women that call themselves Southern Baptist or, or Gospel Evangelist. They come in all types of shapes and sizes, as I've said, presenting a perverted gospel that saves nobody. Most of the time, they're teaching a works-based form of religion to do this and don't do that, and God will love you and accept you. Keep, you know, don't do these things, do these things, don't do those things. So basically, your salvation is dependent upon uh, how good you keep the rules, not uh, according to the grace of God and, and what uh, Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. That's why the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses are so active. They're always out and about. You, you, they're everywhere, all the time. You know why? Because they're trying to earn their way in. There's only, a lim there's only limited seating available. And so it's like the, the more you do, the better chance you get to make it in. If you don't make the cut, then you're out of luck. They're trying to earn their way into heaven. And the Bible tells us you can't do that. You know, if they don't do enough good deeds in this life, then they're just out of luck. But the one true gospel is, is a finished work that is accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. It's what we're going to be celebrating next Sunday. That Jesus has already done all the work necessary for us to be redeemed. No amount of our, our good, own good deeds could ever atone for our sins. That's why Paul is so adamant about the gospel. There is only one way to gain Christ, and that is by grace alone and through faith alone. That is it, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We just studied this on, on Sunday mornings a few weeks back. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone 
should boast. And then Paul here used three derogatory phrases to identify his opposition. That, that first phrase was, beware of the dogs. Beware of the dogs. As you see, in, in ancient times, uh, dogs were not pets. Right? It's hard for us to get our mind around that. You know, that, that's a modern thing. That, that man, dog is man's best friend. That, all that stuff back then, that wasn't even a consideration. Dogs were either weapons or they were nuisances. That's it. That was your two options for, as far as dogs go. And the dogs that Paul was referring to, uh, would have been packs of the, the, the wild stray dogs that roamed about scavenging, uh, in the trash or eating the carcasses of other animals and whatnot. The Jews were, you know, uh, uh, were, you know, to, to them, uh, to the Jews, dogs were the embodiment of uncleanness, of uncleanness. And, and in fact, the Jews were quite fond of calling Gentiles dogs. That was their way of labeling the unclean, uh, Gentiles of the land. And so we're here when, when Paul says this, to beware of the dogs, Paul was flipping the insult around on them, which would have had to, had to be quite uh, something to see if you were to, to be there to witness when he, when he would say this thing to them. And uh, the phrase number two is to, to be, beware. Beware of evil workers. Evil workers. That the Jews believe themselves to be the workers of righteousness as the chosen people of God. That they were the ones that had all the answers. They were the ones who were the experts in self-righteousness, which is no righteousness at all before God. And so as they taught people to add to the gospel for salvation, they had become workers of evil. They may not have intended to, to do that, but that's exactly what they had become, bringing condemnation instead of grace and forgiveness. And then the last one, he called them, beware of the mutilation. He called them the mutilation. That circumcision was the sign of the covenant with the Israelites in the Old Testament. Right, the new and final covenant was of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Something new had come. Circumcision meant nothing anymore. Even before it was only a symbol. It was just another pointless act of self-righteousness. And so Paul was comparing it to the same type of mutilation that pagans would do to appease their false gods. You think of Elijah and the false prophets of Baal, that type of thing, slashing their bodies and mutilating themselves to appease the false gods. That circumcision was just another wasted attempt of self-justification and God would totally reject it. And, and, in fact, you're thinking about that same confrontation with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Elijah openly mocked the prophets of Baal as they slashed their bodies trying to make Baal rain down fire at the showdown on the mountaintop. He was mocking them for what to, you know, slash yourself, dance hard or scream loud or do all these things. Maybe you'll wake up Baal. Maybe he's on vacation, or maybe he's taking a nap, maybe he's in the restroom, whatever the case is, he joked about it. I believe here Paul is openly mocking the Judaizers in the same way. And so for us, what's the bottom line? What is Paul wanting us to, to know about this new opposition because of the gospel and its impact on our lives? We should expect opposition to come. We should. We should expect opposition to come whenever we decide to follow after Jesus. It'll come from the obvious places like the false teachers in your church and satanic missionaries that show up at your house wearing white short sleeve dress shirts and wearing name tags that call them elders such and such and they're only 18 or 19 years old. Mormons is what I'm talking about. I don't know if, is anybody around here experienced a visit from a Mormon? I don't think they come out in these parts too much, but I know around Baton Rouge and we, we got to uh, visit quite a few times. Uh, and so that might be one example. Uh, it'll also come from your mom. It'll come from your dad. Unbelieving mom. Let me clarify. Hopefully, unbelieving mom, unbelieving dad, unbelieving grandparents, unbelieving friends, and also your unbelieving co-workers. And that's why we must be grounded in the Word of God. To be grounded in the Word of God, the only source of truth that we have. And so when you gain Christ, all of hell turns against you. And the enemy will constantly find ways to oppose you, to discourage you, and even try to defeat you. But he can't do it because the victory has already been won. Amen? It's already been won. He can't do anything about that. So when you gain Christ through believing the gospel, you also gain new opposition in your life. And the third gospel gain that we see in our text is a new perspective. New perspective into your life. In verses 3 to 8, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, 
rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I am more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. You see, Paul here begins by quickly identifying himself with the true believers in Philippi when he says, we are the circumcision. We, fellow believers, we are the circumcision, not, not the Judaizers, not, not the ones who are circumcised in the flesh, the ones who are circumcised at the circumcision of the heart are the true circumcision. That's what God intended. That's what God always wanted. That's what God demanded was a circumcision of the heart, not of the flesh. And so to have a new heart that loves God and causes us to worship Him in the Spirit, a new heart that, that, that loves God and causes us to rejoice in Christ Jesus, a new heart that causes us to have no confidence in the flesh, a new heart that loves Jesus above all else. You see, the, 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 listen to what Jesus told those that were following after Him about the love that He requires for discipleship in Luke 14. Right, he raised, he sets the bar pretty high. Luke fourteen twenty five to thirty three, it says, "Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And when whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost?" whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a great delegation and asks conditions of peace. Verse 33, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Have you forsaken all to follow Jesus? Do you have any plans on forsaking all to follow Jesus? Because that's what he requires. You see, this is a deal breaker to be a disciple of Jesus. That's what he's making clear. If you're not willing to forsake all, then you're not qualified you cannot be his disciple forsaken all things is not optional our love for jesus must be so much greater than our love for our spouses our children our brothers and sisters and even ourselves that looks like hate in comparison he's not telling us to literally hate our, our children or to hate our wives or even hate our own lives it's a comparison he's, he's kind of uh, it's hyperbole that, that jesus is, is not calling us to uh, to calling us to love others less, Jesus is demanding that we love Him more than everyone else. That's a huge distinction. That Paul knew firsthand the dangers of loving yourself and your accomplishments and your titles and your family and your race and your religion above all else. He knows. He knows all too well what happens. That the Judaizers were teaching a salvation based off of works and accomplishments. They were teaching people to have confidence in their flesh what they can do for themselves. And Paul, of all people, had, had every right to be confident in, in, in the flesh if that's what it took to be loved and accepted by God. He had a great resume. A great resume. But you see, that doesn't cut it. Self-righteousness, all of your accomplishments doesn't account for anything. It doesn't matter. It takes us rejecting the works of the flesh and depending on Christ completely and His finished work on the cross. That's what must happen for us. That's the perspective that we must have in verse 8 paul calls all the great things that he accomplished and once held so high highly rubbish rubbish and of course most of your bibles the, the english translation uh, translation there for that word rubbish it's been sanitized it's been cleaned up i mean some of y'all's translations might be a little more uh close to what it means 
But in the Greek, the, the word rubbish, it means the excrement of animals. Dung. It means manure. That's what he says. All, all these things, all of his resume, all these wonderful things that he's accomplished to him was poop. That's it. Manure. Dung. Awful. It's meaningless. Worthless. See, what if we could begin to see all things that way? What if we can begin to, to see all things that we are striving so hard to accomplish and find our security in and our meaning in and our identity in if we could begin to see it as manure? See, why can't Christ be enough? Why can't Christ be enough? So let me be as clear as I can be tonight. Yes, be everything that God has, has wired you to be. Yes, be the best at everything you do to the glory of God. Do everything that God burdens your heart to do. But do not find your identity and worth and security in those things. Let me say that last part again. Do not find your identity and worth and security in those things. You see, and, until you, you can get to the point where you can and count all things as lost like Paul in comparison to the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, your walk with Christ will be nothing but dung. And some of you already know this because you're in the middle of it now. You know exactly what I'm saying. You're trying to do it your way. You're, you're trying to chase after all that the world has to offer. And you're running yourself ragged and you're miserable. Rest. Rest in Christ is what Paul would say, is what the Bible would tell us. Just picture it this way, maybe, maybe to make it easier for you, because this is what Paul was trying to communicate, I believe. We can either cling to Jesus or we can cling to a big pile of manure. Really, I mean, that, that's it. That's your two options. That's a, either follow Christ, do things Christ's way, cherish Christ, or cherish your big steaming pile. That's your options. And it is that drastic and it is that extreme. That is your choice to make. And so which one would you prefer? You shouldn't have to hesitate, but in reality, many of us are. We're struggling with what choice to make. Do I want this or do I want Jesus? And listen, again, we've already said as I began, we, you can't have both. You can't have both. It should be an easy decision. It should be a pretty easy decision to make when you have the right perspective on things. You see, when you gain Christ through believing the gospel, you also gain a new perspective on life. You see, this was, this passage I said was familiar to me because this was the first passage of scripture that I had to really dissect when I was in seminary. And in a hermeneutics class, they, we had a choice to pick between this passage or a passage from Isaiah. And of course, I chose this one because the passage in Isaiah it took more work. There's more steps to the process than hermeneutics. And so I took the, the easy way out. And I, I'm glad I did. Uh, this, this passage has been a huge a blessing to me on a, on a very personal level. It, it blew me away then and it still blows me away now because it's such a powerful piece of Scripture. It really is. It's, it's so, it, it's so uh, powerful and it will change your life. It will change the way you, 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 you see things so differently once you understand what Paul is trying to say here to us. And so to my brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, don't, don't ever get tired of hearing the gospel. Don't ever get tired of hearing the gospel. Don't sit there and think to yourself, I wish Brother Mike would preach something else. I wish Brother Mike would move on to something else. I'm, I'm so tired of hearing about the cross. I'm so tired of hearing about the blood. I'm so tired of hearing about redemption. I'm so tired of hearing about hell. Can we move on to something else? No, we cannot. We cannot move on from Jesus and His gospel. We will not move on from Jesus and the gospel. If you want to move on from the gospel, you need to move me on because that's all I'm going to preach about. That's what I'm here for. Don't ever get tired of telling other people about the gospel either. That's why you exist. That's why you are still here. That is the essence of the church. The Great Commission. To tell other people about Jesus. To share the gospel. Let your joy in the Lord be contagious. Right? <laughs> we want people to, to be excited about following Jesus. Not, not like we're marching through a POW camp. Let your joy show. Expect opposition. Right? Guard your heart and your mind with the truth of the Word. Put on the full armor of God every single day because you, you're going to need it. You are going to need it. I promise you that. And then keep, your, uh, keep the proper perspective on things. 
that nothing or no one should hold a higher place in your life than Jesus Christ. Nothing or no one should hold a higher place in your life than Jesus Christ. And to our guest here tonight, how would you like to gain eternal life in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? It's a pretty sweet deal. It's a package. right? It all comes together. Here's how you do it. I'd invite you first to count the cost. We just, we just read the passage that, that, that tells you what's required. Right? There, there, there's some things that you need to be willing to do to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Count the cost. Decide whether you're willing to do those things or not if you're called to do so. And then the Bible would also tell us to repent. To repent of our sins. To, to turn from the, the sin that has condemned us to hell and turn towards Jesus for His grace and His forgiveness. And then, and then we're also told to confess to confess our faith in Him and His work on the cross. And it really is just that easy. It is. It's really that simple that Jesus has already done the hard part. All we got to do is receive it. Receive it by faith. That Romans 10, 9, and 10 tells us this. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. No questions asked. You see that? You will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So church, I would just close tonight with this. Believe the gospel and gain Christ. Believe the gospel and gain the benefits of the gospel. Let's pray and we'll have a time of response. Father, we do give you thanks for the gospel. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for the cross. We give you thanks for the blood. We give you thanks for the resurrection. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all of those things would be for naught. Father, I thank you for this passage tonight. Thank you for this great reminder that we have in, in Christ, that He is indeed the, the most precious thing in our life, even above our spouses even above our children, even above our grandchildren, even above our careers, anything that we would hold so much uh, esteem for, that Christ is worth much, much more. So Father, I pray that you would change our hearts tonight. If there be anything that is drawing us away, that is pulling us away from, from pursuing and, and following after uh, Christ's will for our lives, God, that tonight that would come to an end, that we would give it away, that we would lay it down at the altar and it would be gone forevermore. Father, I also pray for those here tonight that have not yet received Christ, have not gained Christ, do not have a personal relationship with Him, have not received eternal life, that tonight might be that night. Father, I pray that You would give them the, the, the courage and the boldness to repent of their sins and to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior and do it publicly and step out and say, I want to follow after Jesus. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to live for Him from this day forward. God, would You do that also in this place? God, help us to apply this word to our lives. Help us to be doers of your word and not hearers only. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.